Well, it is football season. For some of you, that is a big deal. Others of you, you may not have even known until I just mentioned it. If you follow football, and especially if you do fantasy football, you have an interest in the players and what position they play. What each player adds to the team. You can't just choose any person to do anything on the team. In football, in fact, it's actually official that different people have different titles and they do different jobs. Other sports, it's a little less less official that if you're playing basketball, your team may have agreed that you do a certain role there, but you can pretty much do anything you want as one of those people on the court at a time. You're not restricted from taking a shot because you're standing on the wrong side of the court. In football, however, there are set positions. When you choose your your fantasy lineup, you can't just fill in quarterbacks all the way down. And if you did, they might say, well, he did a really bad job as being the whole defensive team of a team. That quarterback was not a great defense. Each person on a football team has a specific role that they will fill. And the same thing is true of the church. That in the church, we talked last week about spiritual gifts. This week we're going to look a little bit closer and identify who in this church has different gifts. How those gifts work together in the the roles that each of us play in serving in this church. How the people around you are able to serve and how you're able to serve. This week we're going to see the position that you have in God's team here in this congregation. We're going to be looking at the same passage we looked at last week, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read parts of it here that talk about these lists of spiritual gifts. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to start here in verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given, through the Spirit, the message of wisdom, To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to each one, just as He determines. And then if you'll skip ahead with me to verse 27, continues here. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those who have gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. This is the Word of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy, for the gifts that You have given us. And we ask that You would open our hearts now that we would hear from You. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Last week, of course, we began speaking on spiritual gifts. Hopefully, if you were here or if you've read this passage before, you understand that God has provided gifts for His people. That spiritual gifts are present in the church today. That these gifts were not for another time, but they are for us now as we serve as God's people. That the gifts are meant to be used for the encouragement of the church, for the common good, as it says in this verse. And that the power of these spiritual gifts comes Because of the presence of God. Today we're going to be looking at these these lists of gifts, which are not meant to be all-inclusive, that this is not an exhaustive listing of of every possible way that the Holy Spirit can work through someone, but to give you a sampling of, of how the Spirit works. And I want you, as you're listening today, to try to identify gifts that you believe you may have, but also to take it a step farther than that and to identify gifts that you believe the people around you may have. Many of you who have been in the church for for years may have already had something like a spiritual gift inventory. And those are often uh, helpful to help you identify 
how God has called you to serve and how you can be helping the church, but they often are done individually. That they help you identify your gifts, but we don't spend a lot of time often on identifying the gifts of the people around us. And I want to do some of that today. I'm going to start off with a few opening little facts, universal things that are true of all of these spiritual gifts. Help you understand how you can identify these gifts and how God can use them. And then we'll go into the specific gifts where we'll talk about each one, what it means, and then you'll have the chance to identify people that you believe have those gifts. So starting off with spiritual gifts, we have to remember what they are. What a spiritual gift really is, because a spiritual gift is God's ability to use you in his church. It's not just a, a natural ability or something that you believe that you're good at. It's not something that you just enjoy doing, but it is God's ability to use you. Actually, as you look at your own spiritual gifts and the gifts of the people around you, you may find that it is hard to identify those gifts. And it can be hard in one of two ways. It can be hard to identify a gift because you may believe that you have a gift simply because you like doing something when you are not gifted in that way. I think of this, this test I saw online car, called the Distorted Tunes Test. It's a test where they give you 26 sample songs of children's songs, patriotic songs, even some religious songs in there, tunes that you would probably know. And they play them either correctly or incorrectly, and you have to tell the difference. So they'll play, Mary had a little lamb. And you say, oh, yeah, that was right. And they say that you go through it, you get your score. They say 2 to 5% of people just cannot tell. Yeah, I don't know. Those all sounded good to me. And other people, when I took the test, when Angela took the test, she was ready to pause those samples, right? No, no, wrong, wrong, stop. I cannot hear you play that song wrong any longer. You know, what a blessing if you and your spouse both fail that test. To be surrounded your whole life by music, which to you sounds beautiful. But if you believe that you are, are a gifted musician and you pass that test, you should reconsider. In the same way, if, if you believe that, that you are gifted by the Holy Spirit to perform a certain task in the church, but God is not effectively able to use you in that task, no matter how much you enjoy doing that, you should consider that perhaps that's not your gift. You also might have the error on the other side where, where something comes easily to you and and God is easily using you in a certain field of ministry. But you've never considered it a gift because you thought, well, that's just how it always works, isn't it? You go out to eat, you start talking to the waitress. Ten minutes later, she's asking to uh, accept Christ into her heart. And it's not because you did any effort. Anyone would do the same thing that you did. But you've been so blinded by God's effectiveness in you that you fail to see it as, as more than just the natural working of of God in the people in general. You haven't identified that as a special way that you've been gifted. So as we go through this list, I encourage you to look at both sides of that. Don't, don't jump at saying, ah, this is the gift for me, because you think, I would sure like to do that in the church. But don't also put it aside and say, no, 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 I don't think that's really me, because I've never, I've never enjoyed doing it. Yeah, I mean, God uses me when I do it, but, but I don't always want to do that. In fact, this chapter talks about, as we talked about last week, that some people would, would have their own gift and they would see it as unimportant or something they didn't want to do. And others would, would have a gift and they'd say, this is the only thing that's important in the church. They hit those two extremes. We also have the question of whether gifts are, are strictly miraculous or if some of them are, are kind of a more natural thing that happens in the church. I think it really hinges on, on what you consider a miracle. Because each of these gifts is the Holy Spirit working in a person to change the world for the good of this church, for the good of the church universal. And so you may say, well, some of these, they don't sound like they're, they're miracles. You're not, you're not moving a mountain by doing that. But it's God's power interceding in this world. Which when we say that that is what a miracle is. So as we look at the list Try to separate out your own enjoyment of the task or, or even 
just what other people have said about it and how God is using you. That even if you believe that you are a, a wrench-shaped person, if God's been effectively using you to knock in nails, you may be gifted as a hammer. Now we'll get into this list of gifts. First, we have a number of gifts that deal with, with the Word of God, that deal with, with God bringing knowledge or wisdom to people or being able to understand God's Word. So we have these in, here it says in verse 8, To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. We also have the gift of, of teacher. In Ephesians, it combines pastor and teacher as gifts. That these gifts are, are gifts of the Word, of your ability to use words effectively through the Holy Spirit to touch people. So if you are gifted at, as a teacher, then you're able to explain what the Scripture says, to bring truth to people in a way that they can understand as well. If you are gifted with a message of wisdom or a message of knowledge, you are able to, to apply specific knowledge to circumstances in ways that God can use, or to provide wisdom to people who are in need of wisdom. If you think about your own ministry and your time in the church, think of, are the words that you say, the knowledge that you have in the past, are you able to, to bring those to bear on people's life in a way that is effective? And if so, you may have one of these gifts. Pastor, teacher, wisdom, and knowledge. If you don't have this gift, think of who you know who has touched you in these ways. Who's been used by God in your presence. I gave you plenty of room in your, in your notes there. So as you think of gifts, you can write down wisdom. And you can put down a name. Here's someone I know who has wisdom. Knowledge. Here's somebody who has been able to consistently share the knowledge with me used by God. Then there are a couple other word-type gifts, prophecy and apostle, which are a little bit different. Sometimes we get caught up in the idea that, that prophets or apostles, they were only concerned with writing Scripture. But these New Testament gifts are not given only to the people who have written the text that we have in front of us, but they were given to the church. That there was, in the case of prophecy, words inspired by God, yes, but words that were not on the same level of Scripture, words that were given as God's message in the moment. We may think of prophecy as that person who, who, even if you haven't shared your situation with them, they seem to always have the words to say, something that touches you, that encourages you. Maybe you're that person that sometimes you feel like, man, I should, I should just share this thing with you. And it touches people's hearts. In the same way, apostle, that uh, has been used specifically of the apostles that were in Jesus' presence and with Paul. Paul also calls Barnabas an apostle. James, the brother of Jesus, is an apostle. But more widely, he, he says that there are apostles to these various churches and from churches that he writes to. People who are sent, messengers. And you maybe have that gift if you're the type of person who, who goes forth and brings God's message, that you are a messenger for God. And if you don't have it, think of somebody that you know who, who may fill that, that role. That they are effectively used by God in new frontiers. To take the gospel farther to people who haven't heard it. And that goes along with the task of, of evangelists, which is mission, mentioned in Ephesians. That an evangelist is someone who is able to bring the gospel to those who need to hear it someone who, who brings that truth to those who need it. That if you have the gift of evangelist, you may be gifted specifically in, in speaking to the unsaved and helping them understand the truth. But, but more than that, because these gifts are given for the church, if you have the gift of evangelist, you are probably effectively used by God to spur others to preach the gospel. To help others be equipped for that type of ministry. That we are each called to be those messengers of God, to be the people who takes the gospel to those who need to hear it. But those gifted as evangelists 
are effectively used to strengthen the church in the task of evangelism. If you've been able to do this in the past and God is using you in this way, you may have this gift of evangelist. Even if your ministry today does not specifically involve speaking to the unsaved, even if that's something that you dread doing, if you are effective in that, the Spirit may be working in you with the gift of evangelism. If you don't have that gift, think for a moment, who do I know who is an evangelist? Who do I know that the Spirit uses in that way? And take a moment to write down there who it is that fills that role in this church. As we're going through these lists, I encourage you that if, if you have gifts that, that you believe, I don't know anyone who does that. You should get to know other people in this church that after church today, you should be able to, to identify people and tell them, ah, when Pastor Andrew told me about this gift, I thought of you. And I want, I want you to know that I've seen God use you in this way that maybe if, if one of them speaks to you and you feel like that's your gift, that you would, you would approach others around you and say, I feel like I might be gifted in this, but this is something that I do. Do you feel God effectively uses me in this? Is this just something that, that I kind of enjoy? Or is this the Spirit empowering me? Like, keep your eyes open for these things. Then there are a series of of gifts that we often consider the, the miraculous gifts, the sign gifts, the, the ones that, that we think, well, man, that would be amazing to have that. He lists off gifts of healing or miraculous powers, dis distinguishing between spirits, the gift of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. But I believe that, that if you have one of those gifts, you would probably know it at this point, as many of you are mature Christians who are here. But I don't want you to, to be confused and say that that you can't possibly have a gift of healing because you haven't done large enough miracles. But if God is using you to bring healing to people, you don't need to doubt your ability to have a gift like this. There are other gifts that he lists here too. The gift of faith. Faith which is, which is universally given to Christians on the one hand, and yet which is specifically given to some for the good of the church. That there are some people in the church who have the spiritual gift of faith. That when others are shaken, they stand firm. That when, when difficulties come, when hard times come, they're able to stand up and say, we will not give up. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you haven't even identified this gift. That, that faith has just come easily to you. That steadfastness holding to the promises of God. That when others are shaken, you, you don't see it because of them not having that gift, but you, you question, well, I mean, I guess, are you even a Christian? Which is an easy trap to fall into. But if you are gifted that way in faith, that you are, you are steadfast and, and prompted by the Spirit to hold strong and to share that strength, your role in the church is to, is to encourage others when they are weak. Have them stick with their faith and identify the weaknesses in faith in others. If, if you have that type of ministry, this may be your gift. And if you don't have this type of ministry, I want you to think about who you know who is used by God in that way. Whose faithfulness you can look to. Say, well, they are a rock in the church. Then we have some other gifts. We have the gifts of, of helps. The ability to help other people. This is a gift that some may, may think they have and not be used effectively in. Oh, sure, I'll show up. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. I'll stop on by. I'll bring my hammer. No, we're doing glass blowing. Don't bring, don't bring a hammer. No, 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 it's fine. I have a 10-pound sledge. No, don't. Just don't. No, I'm glad to help out anything you want. Okay, I want you to put the hammer down. No, 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 not that. Come on, just, just let me take a few swings. That you may, you may want to be used by this way and you might want to be a helpful person or the opposite may be true that, that, man, you just really dread that people keep calling you. They just keep needing things from you. And yeah, you know, you could help out, but it's kind of a pain. Can't someone else do it? But maybe you are being effectively used by God that even in areas where you are not particularly skilled, that you can come alongside somebody and help them in their task. That other people are more effective 
with you there. That when it, people start a project, they say, ah, we need to call Jim. He doesn't know anything about this, I don't think, but, but wouldn't it be great to just have him there? Doesn't it seem like everything works just a little bit better with Jim around? If you have that type of gift, then you can use it to encourage these people and to, to increase the effectiveness of their work for the church. And if, if you don't have it, think of somebody who you would just enjoy to have any project have their help alongside of them. How do they work in the church? Serving is a similar gift, that the people who serve are those who are able to fix the things behind the scenes. That they might not be the person out in front, but they take care of stuff. They get stuff done. They see the needs and they meet them. Maybe that's you. And if it's not you, who do you know who is able to serve effectively, regardless of the role? Then there's the gifts of administration and in Romans, it talks of the gift of leadership. People who are either able to, to set direction for the church or to, to figure out all the details to, to make things fit together and work. The two gifts don't necessarily have to go together either. You may be a great leader who is a terrible administrator. Someone who is, who is used by God to set direction and to rally people together. Maybe, if that's not you, you know somebody who is like that. That when they get something in their mind... You can't help but be drawn along with them. Write their name down. Who do you know that is a leader in this church? Or who do you know that's an administrator? That, that even if they're not that into an, a program, if you could just get them to be in charge, you don't have to worry about anything else. They'll find the right people. They'll get the right supplies. Things will work out. Maybe that's what you do. Maybe that's where you're most effectively used by God. How is God using you in the church for that? And if it's not you, who do you know that you could turn to for these types of gifts? Then in Romans, we have a few other ones. We have encouraging. Someone who just is able to, to bring joy and renewed strength to other people. You might see someone who just always looks on the bright side. And boy, can that be annoying. No, there is no bright side here. Sometimes I'll tell Angela, if she's had a bad day, I'll say, look on the bright side. She'll say, what's, what, okay, what's the bright side? I don't know. I thought maybe you could figure out a bright side. People with the gift of encouragement, they can always find that bright side. They can always spur you on again to love and good deeds. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you can bring joy and renewed strength to people. But if it's not you, if that's not you, who do you turn to for that in the church? Who do you know who has that giftedness and is used by God in that way? Then there's the gift of mercy. People who, who won't let you hold a grudge. Who say, you can forgive, you can let this go. God's in control, you don't have to be. Maybe you have that gift. Maybe, maybe you are constantly in the church bothered by people who, who can't seem to forgive and let God's mercy work. Maybe you've never seen it as a gift. Maybe you've seen it as, as a struggle that you have. But if that's your gift, then use it in the church and encourage our church to be one full of mercy. If you don't have that gift, seek out someone who does. Let them be an advisor to you. Someone who you can turn to and say, I've been having this conflict. What do you think I should do? Knowing full well that they may say, let it go, forgive, show mercy. Who do you know who has that gift? Who leads this church in mercy? Each of these gifts is given by the Holy Spirit. Though there may be other gifts, other ways that the Spirit is able to encourage and use people in the church. Though there are some things that, that aren't listed as spiritual gifts, but we see as, as the use of, of gifted people in the church. For instance, our musicians who are up here. That spiritual gift of musical ability is often not on lists of spiritual gifts. But it would be an ability that you'd have that you could serve the church with. These lists are not meant to be 
exhaustive of all the ways the Spirit can work. And even if you have other ways that you're serving, if you're serving in music, think of how these other gifts can affect that. Because they do cover a wide array of ways that we can serve in the church. So maybe you're a a musician or a singer, but you're gifted in the gift of, of mercy. That others who who perform with you are always encouraged by, by your ability to overlook missed notes. Not because you failed the distorted tunes test, but because you have a higher purpose in worship. Perhaps you, you serve in the cafe or you do other tasks around church with building maintenance. But your giftedness is in words of wisdom. And you use that time when you work along people to speak into their lives. In the next week, we're going to be looking at, at how our passion intersects with our giftedness. Because at Living Hope, we really believe that it is God's gifting of us that lets us be effective. And that it is our passions that help direct how and where we are going to serve. Coming into this next year, and at the end of this year, we'll be talking about living hope for all generations. This idea that, that the hope of our faith in Jesus Christ is meant to be passed on from generation to generation. That each generation can serve those before and those after it. And understanding your giftedness is the first step to seeing how God can use you. I hope that, that as we've gone through this list of gifts, you've taken the time to write down where you feel like you are gifted. But more than that, that you've also written down the names of others who have gifts that I've mentioned today. That after this service, that in the week to come, you will speak to those people and you will say, here is how I see God using you. That you would encourage them to use their gifts. That each of us would work together to encourage one another for the common good. That this would be a church strengthened by the Spirit for years to come.